Trish McLean. Present. Todd Schneider. Here. Lauren Sharp. Here. Melissa Smith. Present. Connie Wengern. Present. All right, y'all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before you are the minutes from the previous meeting. Move to accept the minutes from the previous meeting. Okay. I'll we second. Have, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Lauren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weingarten. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, next on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Just Oops. Just a just a change. Obviously, um, Mike Lee is is uh, absent uh, this evening, uh, recovering from an illness. So um, we're gonna um, we're not we're going to uh, table uh, his item item E. I move we approve the agenda with item E under reports being tabled. Okay. Second. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Lauren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weingarten. Aye. The motion passes. Um, moving on to opportunity for the audience. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the board? No takers. Uh, moving on to our Fort Morgan High School student representative. Yeah. She's playing I, soccer in Greeley. Yeah. Playing Excuse soccer. me, I missed Hannah. Um, so busy time of year, and I've got a sticky note here that we've only got 38 days until school is out. <laughs> oh, so it's taking away fast. <laughs> Unless you're district office staff. <laughs> <laughs> It's more than 38 days. <laughs> so moving on to board reports. Any any board reports? Okay, superintendent. You know, just a clarification on uh, an item that we um, had approved at a previous board meeting. Uh, we approved a public school calendar uh, for the for um, fiscal. Or for for school year 1920 and 2021, and one of the items that um, I think probably I didn't I did not do um, a good a good of enough job in explaining is our spring break for the next two years does not align with MCC spring break, nor with. Um, uh, Wiggins School District or Brush School District. I want to make sure I pronounced it right. <laughs> <laughs> Wiggins. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I knew there were two. There were two G's. Make sure I get it right. Um, Wiggins or uh, Wel Weldona Valley. And I, you know, where that came about is. Um, Real, simply the superintendents in, the, in those districts reached out to me and said they wanted to move their spring break forward because their staff thought there was too much of a, of a lapse of time between the holiday break at winter time and spring break. The problem r we run into is our athletic competition. I mean, we have more kids impacted by moving that that break time for athletics, then we have kids that are going to MCC. So either any way we do it, kids are going to have to come in over that time and continue with their studies or continue with their activities. And, and we took it, you know, to our um, committee and that's, and that's where, and that was the decision of our committee. So again, I apologize on my end if I did not fully explain that. Um, but that's, I, I guess we can look at that next year and see how that, you know, if, if that's impactful to our kids, we can move that. 
Um, I was, I'll tell you, I was surprised MCC m moved in that direction because I told them that's early on, that was not the way that we were planning to go. Do you folks have concerns about that? Um, speaking as an instructor and a parent, it's going to be a pain in the neck. Okay. But I understand the reasoning. I may not agree with it, but I understand yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. And it's going to that's going to affect a lot of parents and a lot of kids because when they're on spring break, they're going to be out to college, so there's going to be a a screwy part in there. So and just just be prepared for parents to co to be complaining about it. Okay. I have to believe it's going to affect a pretty big number of kids. What did you know? What did we say? Did what did we say when we talked about that? What was our numbers that we had noted? Oh, I don't know that. Clint? 57. Thank you. 57 students. I knew, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I was trying to remember what our athletic numbers were. Well, we had about 70 girls out for girls' soccer, so that's one sport alone. That's one sport. So, just so I don't, because I'm trying to get my brain wrapped around this, so I can understand with MCC the difference in schedule as far as athletics then that means that there are um, competitions with other schools so yes. that's why yeah. our so we're trying to align with other schools in our in our conference in yes our conference okay yeah. so all right so I, I mean I reached out to Harrison on that I can certainly go back and double check and make sure I did not miss anything and come back to the board again next month we, st we still have that time. And would you like me to do that one more time just to double check and make sure my numbers are, are rock solid on that? I guess, I guess to me the important part is the calendar committee. It's a calendar committee made up of certified staff, I assume. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Determined that was the best, I, I would support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I don't think you're going to come across the magic schedule yeah you're, you're I, I not ever going to be able to meet everything you know and I'll reach out to in the interim I'll you know because we still have time I will reach out one more time again to Dr. Freed and a, and just make sure that um, you know just just try to find out uh, um, to make sure I fully understand MCC's thinking on it okay and then I can come back. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Clarification and discussion. Uh, moving on to Assistant Superintendent of Curricula, Curriculum and Assessment, Dr. Prasco. So I just I just listed a couple updates on grants. I just wanted to make sure you were aware. So <clears throat> we, because we didn't have the last board meeting, um, I had to submit the school health professional grant. Um, so we ended up having to reapply and not because of anything we did the legislature decided that we we thought we were guaranteed another additional year through 1920 and um, because they changed the rules um, the state board we had to reapply so we have reapplied for another um, three years of having a school health professional and reminder that that is all about reducing substance abuse um, at the high school middle school and Lincoln High School and currently um, Kendall Hemphill is in that position we were able to snag her from DHS and she has got a lot um, she's growing her caseload daily I think for students who are disclosing that they have substance abuse issues and so I think that's a really important uh, fit for our district um, general fund picks up 10% and the grant picks up 90% of the um, of the salary and programming that goes along with that um, the one um, we've talked a little bit about our alternative education education campus uh, diagnostic pilot program so CDE has completed their observations that must have been maybe the day of our last meeting seems like and Vicki um, I was at Lincoln this morning and Johan from CDE came out and um, talked about their his findings if you will they talked about strengths and areas of growth for Lincoln High School and 
Um, although I was only there for just over an hour, the staff was having some really good discussion, and Vicki is um, doing a great job of just looking, picking up kind of their system and looking at how we can strengthen um, as a whole their alternative campus. Um, and then along with that comes a little bit of money. We applied for more. Um, we could apply for up to $10,000. We had applied for like $680 to begin with. And uh, so now it will allow us, um, that money has to be expended by the end of June, but it will allow us to attend a transitional leadership institute with CDE in June. A team of folks from Lincoln will be going um, with myself. And um, as well as just looking over at overall programming with the ability to apply for uh, what the Fed, feds call an easy grant um, because of their identification for low graduation rate, we can apply for up to $150,000. Um, that application will open in October. Um, we were a little leery of it this year because sometimes when you apply for money, it, I just, Vicki and I were really unclear of what that could look like. I think we've got a much clearer picture now. So um, more than likely we will be applying for um, those funds to be a district-led um, initiative instead of having an outside consulting firm come in and help us with the, the um, moving forward. I don't know if Vicki had anything to add there, but she might in her report later. Um, I just got preliminary allocations for 2019, 2020 for federal programs. We're going to take about a $30,000 hit in Title I. Uh, Title I's acro down across the entire nation. Um, it looks like all of Title II, Title III, um, Title IV are all pretty consistent with maybe a little increase in Title III set aside for immigrants. Uh, we're only going, to, we're going to get about six thousand dollars less for for that but just kind of keeping update on budget and how how that looks moving forward because a lot of our federal programs money is spent on personnel and I think finally for grant updates um, we um, have the ability to along with the AP incentives grant there's an AP exam fee grant that just came out I didn't intend to apply the turnaround is very quick. It's due tonight um, to Simplicity. So what I had to do is calculate the number of students that qualify. Um, number one, we're having all of our students taking AP courses take the exam. And that is, um, the, this is the first year that we've um, made that a mandatory requirement. And of course, along with that comes a fee. However, in, we have, I think it's under the action items for approval. If you didn't see it with that, we have approximately 37 students who qualify for free reduced lunch. You calculate it times the fee, fee exam. And then once they take the exam, we will actually submit the total number of students who actually took it who qualify for free reduced, and we will get a check back, which is great. You can actually um, utilize some federal programs monies, but it's really great that the state has this um, grant program available. And I did miss one um, grant, um, the wellness grant. I just met with the wellness team leaders this afternoon at 4 o'clock, and we reviewed a job description for a district wellness coordinator, which we hope to be posting by the end of this week. Um, remember, that's a big pot of money for two years, like $450,000 to do our planning phase for wellness. The team is very excited about it, and we're just waiting for those budgets to be loaded. I could nudge Mike if he were here to make sure we can spend that money, start spending it. So, And in Head Start grant, one other grant I forgot, um, we're st I submitted that grant in November, and it's still sitting in the federal grants.gov system. According to the regional um, Head Start gentleman, we should be hearing in about another month. And so I know I've talked to Michelle, and she's, I mean, we're really just going with what the Head Start folks are telling us. They're behind. They haven't even looked at our application yet. But they're going to get to it within about the next few weeks. And I get the, the nervousness a little bit is knowing we need to know that that funding exists, right, for the next um, five years at Head Start. And so um, working with them on that. And thanks to the, a couple board members who are going to be sitting. Mark Heiner is coming out, the regional um, Head Start 
manager is coming out April 8th um, with a whole team of people from Head Start to do um, walkthroughs and look at the building. And I would love for the board to come and see the finished. Um, it, it's really looking good, and it's time for the board to take another tour, I think, for sure. Um, take note invite. I will finalize the, these music events. We are getting um, a, that ukulele player and East Kali, which is a, ro a social rock justice group. We're going to do a couple evening events, so I will send the information to the board as soon as I've solidified those with the artists. Um, I'm still waiting um, on East Kali. Part of that take note money really is, so they're going to be in the schools during the day toward the end of April, but we also um, had to work with a nonprofit to do some evening coordination of access to music. And so really excited that we're going to be having the ukulele player at Sherman for the evening event because we're going to pair it with um, launching our Growing Fort Morgan readers. And we know we can get a lot of parents there because now those parents have started receiving books um, in, their, in the mailbox. We're doing dual immersion sign up. Uh, we're having parent meeting tomorrow at Columbine to get our third round of students. So um, I, I don't know, I think we already have maybe 10 kids on the list out of 50 slots. So we'll see um, tomorrow's parent meeting. And finally, um, I met with Salud last week about the Smiles Project. And I don't know that I actually have enough of these handouts, but. Um, I'll just pass them down. They actually came and met with me about just um, how we're doing. So they've seen over 1,200 patients since she, they started the project. Um, they have seen, um, they have 535 active kids currently. And so starting at head preschool all the way up to middle school with a few kids being seen at the high school, um, their goal is really to grow the program. And my idea for them was if they could get one of those mobile dental vans to drive around. And so because space is definitely becoming, becoming an issue as we've talked um, just in every building, space is an issue. And so obviously it's kind of an issue for them as well. But they're very excited about um, the momentum they've built with the project and uh, looking at just summer, summer work, keeping up on those kids and also just um, continuing to we know that dental health is leads to a lot of other really good things in the classroom so um, they are doing good things questions for me what's the sounds like you're very busy things are crazy busy but it's great it's april what's the background of this wellness coordinator going to look like the background is it a nutritional background? What, we actually or? just looked at, that's interesting that you asked. We, Michael and I, uh, Michael worked really hard to get an, uh, like a, another district's description. And so I actually have it right here. We've tweaked it a little bit. So what we're really asking for is a, B, a bachelor's, preferably in studies related to health and wellness. So health, exercise, science, nutrition, or a related field is what we're really looking for. We had a lot of discussion and debate about how many years of experience you'd want the person to have. And so um, we, we came with, well, we'd liked a person with experience, but it's really important that we get the right person at the helm of a district wellness coordinator because I think it's more than just running the grant. It's all about it, like pairing up with HR and how can we look at employee wellness and pairing up with food nutrition services and how do we build more student wellness. And so. That is what we're looking at right now as I tweak this description to maybe be posted. Does that answer your question, Derek? Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you. Yep. It'll be exciting to see how that, yep. how that comes in. out and how it works. And so thank you for your report. You're welcome. Um, we're skipping Mr. Lee. Um, we hope he has a quick recovery. Um, moving on to our human resources director, Mr. Boyer. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, on your uh, consent agenda tonight uh, our first of probably many uh, new hires for the 2019-20 uh, uh, school year. Uh, that includes uh, an athletic trainer, uh, finally. So we'll have that person in uh, place uh, for fall. And then a uh, fifth grade position, seventh grade position. And then Lisa um, found a uh, school psychologist intern that she'll be working with um, come fall. So. We've started uh, that process. Uh, we 
Uh, most recently went to the Case Job Fairs, Colorado Springs and um, Highlands Ranch is, is where those were um, held this year. They um, did prove to be pretty successful. We, uh, with the help of some administrators there, gave out a few intents that did come through and so we um, all told we'll probably have hopefully more than this but three uh, from that job fair and then there's a group of seven of us going to UNC this uh, week, uh, Thursday and Friday, and it um, is shaping up to be um, a pretty good um, uh, job fair. There's been a lot of resumes already sent out, so we anticipate a lot of folks there. And then um, Lisa and I are going to Michigan the following week, and then we'll round out the job fairs at uh, uh, CSU end of April. Um, so, so far, I think uh, we're a little ahead of the game than we were uh, last year. So. Uh, things are looking good. Um, other than that, uh, working on the salary survey, continuing to do that, and um, also um, doing negotiations with the two uh, groups, FMEA, and then here shortly the classified group. So that's it. Any questions? questions? Okay, thank you for your report. Uh -huh. Moving on to English Language Development Director, Shelly O'Connor. Hello. Um, not a lot of new stuff going on. I did get in on a pilot with Will Johan from CDE. They're offering some online ELL courses for this professional development that we need. And so they were asking for teachers, but I thought it would be a really good opportunity for me to kind of see what they were doing. And so I got in on that, so I'm excited about that. Um, just conducted an ELL material survey which was part of the OCR requirement. And so uh, I filled out a Google um, form so that the teachers could then answer each of the questions, some of them multiple choice, some of them check boxes, some of them short answer. And so I've got that data in, so I will get that together, share it with the ELL teachers tomorrow at our ELL meeting, and then share it with the principals at some point as well so I can get that feedback. Um, Kind of a busy week. The high school is uh, doing some scheduling, so I'm happy to join them so we can kind of work on some of those issues that we've been having with not having enough um, opportunities for the ELL students to take some of the basic courses that they need for graduation, so I'm excited about that. And then the most exciting thing is Melinda, who is amazing in the tech department. We've got the home language survey online. It's a requirement by CDE that every parent um, takes the home language survey. If they mark only English, then that they move on and there's nothing to do with that. But if they mark any language other than English spoken in the home, spoken by the student, it doesn't really matter, then those kids are automatically flagged to be given the WIDA screener. And she's got that process now, so when parents register online and anything is marked other than English, it automatically emails anybody who would like to be emailed in that building. And it's um, including myself, I get all of the emails, and so does Diana Morgan um, here at the district office, which just kind of helps us keep track and keep tabs and kind of really streamlining that process, making sure that we're following the guidelines um, provided by the state and the federal guidelines. And so that's another neat thing. And so it's been up and running for a few weeks now. So we've gotten, unfortunately and fortunately, lots of new kids, lots of new ELL kids. It's just a challenge. It's a good challenge, but it is a challenge this time of year right before testing. But um, So that's been a really amazing process, having those emails come out and being able to see constantly how many new kids we're getting and how many of those kids are ELL students. Any questions for me? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to Special Services Director, uh, Lisa Meagle. Good evening. Uh, let me give you a couple updates. Uh, gifted and Talented, so their fourth quarter STEM uh, starts tomorrow. They have 66 students enrolled in that. Uh, they're getting ready for the, the kids' college, which is coming up this summer. And uh, Randy is working on the application for the annual grant that they do. So all the, that's in process. Um, our Converge kiddos are getting their services here in the afternoons. So um, everybody's had an opportunity to kind of meet them and get to know them a little bit. Um, so hopefully that's temporary and we get something worked out for them. But that is working out currently. Um, additionally, um, 
I am working with contracting companies to fill a third school psychologist position. And right now I have two interviews with one of the contracting companies <coughs> coming up on Friday. So fingers crossed that'll be taken care of. And then we're looking at um, what we can do with PT as there may be maybe some changes with our, our physical therapy services. Uh, I think that right now that's kind of the big things on my plate. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to Information Technology Director. Brian Amack. I also want to call you the Wizard of Oz coming out from, the <laughs> from behind the curtain. Behind the curtain there. <laughs> Brian, 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 you could just talk about the discussion item as well. You could just do it all at once. Okay. That's fine. I can split it up or do both. So, okay. um, first ones. of all, I have a new employee. Um, Dalen Mercer from Stephenville, Texas. <coughs> I just so said it. he does talk like yes, ma'am, yes, sir. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. Um, we have our E-rate filled, uh, all the forms filled for this next school year. Um, we're right around eighty-six thousand dollars that we request. <laughs> And what that is doing is a reimbursement for all the fiber optics between this building and our other buildings. Internet coming into the building. We take and right now purchase a gigabyte <coughs> of internet for our buildings. And also some equipment that the high school will be replacing um, this next year. <coughs> um, we had a great spring break. Um, it's one of those times that we can get in and make disruptions and get some different things done. So we installed cameras, smart boards, um, uh, worked on some state testing items, getting that ready to go. I also just want to kind of let you guys know I'm also working on a possible cell phone tower uh, uh, agreement that will be coming to you in the near future if they uh, work on it. Um, we have another company that wants to install another cell tower on the new middle school site. And there's also a monetary value that would come towards us. So that um, may be coming to you. There's some legal agreements that we sent through um, our lawyers um, because they want non-exclusive or exclusive rights to the property and we're not wanting to allow them to have that because we already have one cell phone tower on the site so we can't kick them off to bring somebody else on so that's coming um, as far as the one-to-one -one initiative um, we have 15 members um, attend the I learned conference on February 22nd and 23rd in Denver um, there was a lot of um, good sessions that were being offered, but it also, you could see it building momentum within our district. Um, so that was a good uh, conference to go to to get things started. Um, we've demoed four learning management systems, and this is what the teachers will use to hold their class. Um, we looked at Canvas, Schoology, Google Classroom and Infinite Campuses Learning Management System. Um, we have pros and cons of all of them. We're getting all the questions answered. Um, we're getting demos um, set up so that we can have a small group of teachers come in and actually prepare a class in each one of them so that they can see what it's like. So um, we're still working on that process. Um, could you talk a little bit, Brian, about where, excuse me, um, can you talk a little bit about where we are in terms of looking at some online curriculums? Um, right now, we haven't gone that far. Um, I learned comes with one, but that one's kind of a secondary phase after we do the other. We're pulling a lot of online curriculum from our textbook uh, purchases uh -huh. that we currently Good. have. Good. Yeah, I, I know when we get to that point, I, I mean, I, we, I saw some emails over these last few days. I know when we do get to that point, there's 
many, many resources for online curriculums, and probably we should go about this much the same process as we, oh. as we have gone through with, with the LMS. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And like I told the teachers, they have to be the ones that um, come up with which one they want to use, because it doesn't affect my job, but it affects theirs. So we've really been working back and forth, and there's really getting to be more of a grassroots effort on picking uh, which LMS to use. So that's really good. Um, we're also looking at Chromebooks to purchase. And I didn't think I was going to speak, so I'll be right back. We have a couple of devices that we were um, planning to use. We're looking at devices that can turn into tablets. So they're Chromebooks, then they flip around. A lot of the new software is touch enabled. Um, so the kids will be able to flip it into a tablet, um, do more of the Android type applications um, with the tablet form, but then they can also then just use it like a regular, but also the screen is also touch screen. So we're looking so, at those. And uh, so for, for example, Brian and I have talked about our, like for example, our, our, uh, teach, our English teachers, um, they can go on and grade all of their papers electronically. Every one of them. And that would, that would apply, and of course, that would apply to any content area, um, any, any content area classroom. It, the sky's the limit. You can, you can do all your grading right on those tablets. But we're also thinking for like the math classes to be able to write on the screen. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, for art, different ones. Mm -hmm. So we, um, several school districts are now starting to uh, roll these out to both staff and students. So the prices really come down. So we're looking at um, something like this in a bid process, being able to get the price down where it's very compatible to what the prices that I gave you. So we're looking at that. Um, we're going to send a couple of these out. This one's um, Lenovo. Um, we also have a Dell. We're going to send them out and let a couple of kids uh, try them out because sometimes what we see is going to be different than what they see. Uh, but we've spent time with these. We've taken them apart um, to make sure that the keyboards are quick and easy to replace, the screens are easy to replace so that we can um, do um, work on them. Um, Rena and I uh, worked with the iLearn group um, to set up a uh, pilot group of initial training for the blended learning. So we're looking at our first workshop to begin April 29th. <coughs> um, so that's in process. Um, we're working on policy right now, but I kind of need some shakes of heads of what you guys would like to see. Um, would you like to see a yearly use for technology for using these devices? A user fee. Like a user fee. For, oh, the students would have, students and or parents would right. have to pay? Right. I would have no problem looking into that. I mean, they I don't charge know. them a we I wouldn't, as long as it's not a barrier, I, I, I mean, I think when you when, go back to school. Yeah, I know when we had, <coughs> excuse me, when we had originally talked about this, we were moving forward with the understanding that you folks did not want a user fee. I'm, that would be my preference. I'm not interested in a user fee. I feel like if we're requiring the students yeah. to have this yeah. for their school work, I think that that's See, and that's what so, I just need from, to, I kind of, saw head shakes, so I was going under the impression of no, yeah. but kind of. Just what if a student gets one of these and it ends up getting thrown in the water? Do we just give them a new one? Or do they need to be responsible for what's been given to them? Right. See now, me personally, I would like it if we didn't have a fee for them. But we need to have a um, damage 
schedule. Right. So if they purposely break the screen by leaving their pencil in there and they shut the thing, how fed is the schedule? Uh, and have it in their uh, handbooks that if the screen breaks, it's going to be $45. If you, or if you break the screen, it's $45. If you um, pick off the keys and you lose your keys and you want new keys, this is what the keyboard's going to cost. If you damage the entire unit by water, this is what it's going to cost. That's what I would like to see so that they know if they damage it, they're going to have to pay for it. And, and, just, and just again for the, for the boards, um, <coughs> Just, just for some greater un or some understandings that we've been operating off, you know, when Brian and I have spoken with other school districts, or when I've gone to a conference, or when Brian goes to a conference, what we keep hearing back over and over again is kids take care of these for the most part. They, they really do, and it's, it is the, it is, it is very much the exception that that a, a, where, whereby a few kids go out and purposely damage these these one to ones that's that's their textbooks that's their you know that's that's how instruction gets delivered to them and most of our most of the kids the very very great majority take care of them and that's what we keep hearing from all of these school districts is don't have a lot of problems with these things but well, I mean But if you can tell, they cracked it because of um, mishandling it, then I would put that back to a fee schedule. It would just be like the same monitor in our lab. If they damaged it, they would then need to repair it. I personally agree with the fee schedule yes. and also no fees for a user fee. Okay. Agree. Okay. So I will be preparing those and those will come back for you guys to approve. Um, we're getting ready to bid these. Um, as soon as the bid's back, uh, we would like to purchase them so we can get these out to, first of all, the teacher's hands. But I know we can't order them during the summer because if we order them during the summer, they're not going to be here. We need to be the first one in their hopper so that um, the devices get here way before summer starts so that um, they're available for our students when school starts. So we've been busy, but it's kind of exciting. Any questions? Brian, I'm going to put you on the spot. I, looking at the email from a couple weeks ago about the firewall issue, has that been fixed? Was, that, was there anything compromised that we need to be aware of? No, there wasn't anything compromised. We have two firewalls actually and they're sitting um, side by side. They're connected um, to each other so that if we make a change on one, it makes a change on the other. Somehow some software uh, became corrupt on the primary one, it immediately copied it to the secondary one and then it failed. And when it failed, it failed to both of them because it had copied that corrupt file to both. So what we had to do was go back to a factory default. Once we went to factory default, we could get back into them. We uploaded the configuration that we had saved the night before, back up on them. We were able to bring the primary back up. We had the factory default the second one, the same process. Then we had to take and do a, um, another upgrade that they suggested on the um, firewalls. Um, but nothing was compromised because it shut down all communication out. Everything within the district was fine. There was just anything going out to the internet was just completely shut down. But yeah, it was some exciting time. Yeah, it sounds like it was a pretty crazy thing. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Okay. So moving on to principles. We're gonna. He's asking if they have 
If they had any very large items, it, so it sounds like they don't. So I just said in the interest of time, um, okay. we'll go on then to, um, Moving on to, discussion, to items. discussion where I'll have more time to talk. Okay. So I guess we'll <laughs> go to discussion items and turn it over to Dr. Hammock to, to start off with the early dismissal. Schedule. So Vicki, you want to you come up real quickly and talk about your um, schedule at Lincoln High School for next year? So in here, I believe you have a copy of the proposed early dismissal for next year. And I think this year, last year, the high school has done a late start. And I think they're looking at somehow expanding that for next year. But one of the things that within the structure of Lincoln, my teachers do not have a common plan time to do any type of collaborative work. Um, they have a prep period each day, but that collaborative across the board just does not happen. And so one of the things that Dr. Hammock challenged us to look at was how can we build more collaborative time into our system? And so what we're proposing for Lincoln High School next year is to have that one day a week where we do an early dismissal. It would be a, a round of two o'clock dismissal. That would give us approximately an hour and three, 45 minutes to two hours of time on a Wednesday to have that collaborative time. Um, with the one-on-one -on -one initiative with curriculum writing with some of the things that we're doing um, with um, adding an eighth period one day a week um, having that time to collaborate and prep for that um, I think is really important and so that is what that proposal is addressing any questions about that? how long is lunch usually 19 minutes. Usually. Oh, always. Every always. It's the longest 19 minutes of the day. <laughs> and that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, I know that was not a typo, that 19 minutes. No, I think it makes sense, and I actually am a fan of the early release model of doing it. So. And, and there's a yeah thank you Vicki okay. appreciate it I, I know you I know you were um, I know you were were spending a lot of time talking about that today at your at your PD at your professional development and mm -hmm. and by the way the professional development work our people were doing today was just just outstanding just outstanding and I do want to follow up on that it's it's somewhat related to what Vicki was talking about. She referenced that um, that the high school is also looking at some uh, adaptations to their schedule for next year. And I've worked with Clint on this and Jalen and Harrison. Um, high school is uh, moving out on the development of a sophomore academy, to, uh, in, which which would be you know uh, again a model v very much akin to the current freshman academy it provides another year of a safety net for our students you know one thing we've talked a lot about at the uh, and we've we've met a couple we've met one time um, just with sophomore teachers and then this morning um, Clint and uh, Jalen and Harrison put together a second meeting um, and the counselors were there as well. It was a second meeting with all of our freshman academy teachers and all of our sophomore academy teachers. I think every single teacher was there. So what, 18 teachers or so, 18, 20 teachers? And again, the, the idea behind those academies is that if you look at an individual teacher, they may have, what, 130 to 150 students over the course of a day, maybe even more than that, that they're responsible for. And for a teacher to, uh, and, and you know, those kids come in and out of their classrooms all day long, 
and it's it's very very hard for a single teacher to to really stay on top of all those those kids and all their or the, all the, those students and all their needs and any any uh, cha real uh, learning challenges or and or um, uh, support services that those kids need to success be successful. So what's nice about the academy approach, and it's very much in align with best practice research on uh, schools with very cha challenging demographics like Fort Morgan High School has, is the idea behind that is you shrink the size of the school. You're, you're, you're creating a school within a school and now instead of one teacher being responsible for the so for all of the sophomore students, so what are their next year, about 250 sophomores? Currently we're at 269. Okay. okay. So 270 to our sof sophomores. Instead of one teacher being responsible for, what would we say, about 150 of those sophomores themselves, now you have eight or nine teachers that all have these kids, that all can stay, and, and now we can collaborate with those teachers in one large group. We can be aware of students that are having difficulties throughout their schedule. We can make sure that whatever interventions are built in by, say, a, a single teacher, for example, one thing we talked about today is we can make sure that when we push out a writing model, it's a consistent writing model across those classes. When we teach kids, when we, when we teach our students study skills, we can make sure that we like put, push out a, um, what is that called, uh, SQ3R. We push out an SQ3R model uh, uh, so that our students get that same study skills model in every single class. We can make sure that expectations are the same from all our teachers, uh, that we're tracking tardies the same way, that we're, that we're making parent phone calls. So it, but again, what it does for us is it shrinks the size of the Fort Morgan High School and it creates another safety net for those kids. So now they can have two really good years of good starts and they're much more likely to be successful as juniors, and they're much more likely to be post-secondary ready, college and careers ready, uh, when, they when, the, when they're in, in their senior year. And we can do it. We can do it with our schedule. So questions about that? So are you gonna do that this year? Next year, year, yes. So we're that freshmen now will go into the sophomore They'll go academy. into a sophomore academy for next year. I think it's great. It's 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 another way to do it right up there. We keep, you know, we we keep look analyzing and looking at the high school. In fact, all of our buildings and just keep you know our our people here today, our administrators, um, and and our instructional coaches because I know they were doing a lot of work with with uh, mathematics today. They just keep looking at where we are looking at data and, and Rena leads them through that process and um, really have done a lot of big things this year, I believe. So questions Sorry. on that? On a sophomore academy? And on Vicky, or on Vicky's schedule? I have a question about the sophomore academy. Are we finding that concentrating teachers into these academies takes resources away from, well now, juniors and seniors? Do we have enough counselors to go around for the other classes, enough teachers? I, I, be, I believe so. We've talked about that in our academies and we and we're and we're making sure that you know we're we're gonna we're gonna be building our master schedule what in three days here, two or three days. So Wednesday and Thursday we're gonna be working on a master schedule and we have finally got a total set number of uh, students in their request. I believe we can make it work. Uh, we do put a lot of our, some of our best teachers in the freshman academy. I mean, some of our strongest teachers have been put there, but you know, ultimately the end results we're reaching for is graduation. You know, is getting the kids graduated. If we can get them uh, as many credits as a freshman and sophomore year, 
typically what happens is they get over the hump and their junior and senior is kind of a downhill and they're able to graduate. Um, you know, we'll still, sophomores will still be taking English too. Uh, they will be taking biology and they will be taking American history. That's currently what is offered for most sophomores. Uh, math classes can be a little different. They can take uh, Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2. So they'll still have those offerings, which will be very similar to what is offered freshman year. So we will still be putting teachers and assigning them, um, but we're just, it's not going to be as dramatic of a change as when we first implemented the freshman academy altogether. It's just going to be a few tweaks here and there versus the whole system being changed with adding the freshman academy. We'll just be able to build on it. Okay. Does that answer? Thank you. All right. You know, and again, what I would say is if we do this right, another outcome, and I know we're not there yet to realize it, but our kids will be positioned to take tougher and tougher courses because they were more su they were successful earlier. It, you know that trying to catch them up at the at the junior senior time is just it's just very very difficult. It's much better to make sure they don't fall through the cracks or or have you know major learning gaps as a sophomore or a freshman or a sophomore, and then they can take far tougher courses as they, as they go through your system. And I think that I think further. They're, in, in a, they're also just much better accepting of, of getting themselves in those courses because they can see themselves becoming successful. And we can push out harder on college and career readiness, uh, <laughs> academic requirements for these kids. And I, st I still think we can find ways to better serve our highest level of learners. That's, there's nothing that says there's a dichotomy there or a or it's, or it's incongruent trying to serve uh, kids that are struggling and kids that are very, very high achievers. We can always do a, we can do a good job throughout our system. We just have to focus our resources on every bit of our system. I know we can get it done. I know we can. Okay, so moving on to the laptop So we, so Brian already did the laptop okay, so initiative. On there um, and facilities and grounds. Facilities and grounds, just to catch the board up, I'll be real quick here. We've had trainer uh, HL architects out with us two or three times now. They're still working uh, on our master plan. Their plan is to have um, a master plan in front of the board by May uh, for the f with, with some numbers attached to it for the board to really see what the scope may be uh, in terms of, of financing such a plan. Alternative school f facility options regarding the Converge Day Treatment Center. Yeah, I'm working, the Converge Day School Day Treatment Center, excuse me, uh, has closed. Uh, Lisa's found placement for all of our kids. Um, uh, Right now, I'm in discussions with some some of the other superintendents in the areas in the area about w you know what we're going to do moving forward. We have a ne we have another meeting. Um, Brett Miles, um, uh, geez, um, uh, Bill Wilson, um, and, and myself have have. Uh, have chaired that committee, and we're trying to find some some options for some sort of al an alternative uh, center um, somewhere in this greater, either in the greater Fort Morgan area, and or and or Wiggins and or Brush. So we're looking at at those three areas right now. Our next meeting is the 15th of this month, and I'll I'll keep the board informed on progress on those meetings. Okay, and our last discussion item is the step-by-step -step program and the, t and the tier extension of the Field Foundation funding grant. Yeah, I, I know the board had asked that I place this item on uh, the agenda for discussion. The Buell Foundation um, 
informed um, Mrs. Amen about a two-year uh, extension on a funding grant. I know we're still trying to determine programming. I, I know we've had, a, we've had one discussion on the step-by-step -step program where we're servicing approximately 15 students. Is that right, Bev? 15 students. Um, I th is it two students are from um, Fort Morgan students? Our, our children of Fort Morgan students, I, I said 15 students, 15 children. Two of those children are Fort Morgan high school students. Three of those children are MCC students and the other 10 are staff, they're children of the Fort Morgan staff. Um, and we had talked, um, you know, just in very general terms about about that program, about whether or not we want to continue to have that program in place moving forward. If I'm remembering Michael Lee's numbers, I was thinking somewhere in the $85,000 range was what that yeah. program ends up costing once all the yep. ins and outs. That's it. Around $85,000. Um, you know, at the same time, it's April and it's getting, you know, it's kind of getting toward the tail end of the school year to make decisions um, for for next school year. But I, I wanted to put that out to the Board of Education for a discussion on it. And that grant application is due tomorrow? Well, they're tomorrow. saying tomorrow. tomorrow. Have to know if I have to call them up tomorrow morning. What, what, uh, what is the dollar size of this grant? The Buell Foundation Six, grant? About $60,000. Per so year. That's pretty crucial to that. Yeah. Well, that, and that, so that doesn't account for the $80,000 is general fund out the door. Yeah, so we've already been getting this grant, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, so and this actually, is going to reduce our rental. Okay. And the grant, this grant commits us to two years. I think you have to renew it every two years. Yeah. But I also wonder, though, most of the contracts and grants that my place of work has there's always language in them that if you want to terminate the grant early, I mean, unless they do, I mean, I don't know how they fund if they, oh, but it's Buell, they may just give you one lump sum. Um, because sometimes if they just, you just don't accept the other half. So I don't know, I mean, if either that or if they give you the full two years worth, you spend half and then if at the end of the next year you decide you don't want to do it you just give it back so I, I don't know I mean I think that since it's already April that's doesn't give us a ton of time to discuss it but I don't know I mean I would think that given every environmental scan that our agency has done coming up with our public health improvement plan and just about every community meeting that I've gone to with hospital transformation and everyone is doing these community scans lack of qualified daycare is a huge issue in our community or daycare that's licensed and that's quality so while I could understand the concern of putting eighty thousand dollars of general fund into this program I also think if you if you look at the need that's in our community, taking away the 15 slots that are currently filled, you've got 10 staff families that are going to have to try to find quality daycare for their children, and that is that's not easy to do. So, I I would like to dis to have more of a discussion on this and maybe talk to. Um, Miss Amen about what what kind of a sustainability plan does she have? What would it take to make it so that she would at least break even? I mean, I don't I don't feel like we can just say, oh, we're not going to fund it anymore. I think that we need to look at other alternatives. But 
that's a lot of daycare slots, and especially if you're talking under two, those are, take it from a mom who had twins under two, that was really hard um, to find. And so if you're wanting to encourage, I don't know, I just think that daycare in our region is, is tough to come by, and so just by taking away the 15 slots that are currently funded, that's going to put a burden on some families that currently use it, and I think we need to look at other options. I mean, I understand it's costing $80,000 out of general fund, and the school district is not in the daycare business, but I also think that there are other options that we can look at. I mean, if you look at the after-school program, it lost money for a long time, and now it actually is making money. I think that there are, um, and it's a great resource for our community. So I, I think that there are other things that we can look at. I'm, I'm sympathetic to the daycare situation, um, but I think we need to figure out what is the intent of the program uh, and, and what is the intent of the program going forward. And if it is, is really more of a staff daycare kind of thing, then we need to call it what it is. And we need to look at other options for this program to pay for itself. And we also need to open it up so that's, so that's fair. I don't, know how it's, I don't know how it works now, but so that all staff have the option for it somehow, that it's not more of an, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to call it exclusive, but some, some folks are lucky enough to have their kids in there. And there's probably a lot of staff that wish they could have their kids in there. So I, th I think we just need to be careful on what the intent of the, the, intent of the program is. Is anyone currently paying for their kids to go there? I mean, yeah, are they, they, staff pay, they pay for it, but I think it's a, I think it's I a, don't think that the high school students that attend Fort Morgan High School, I don't think they have to pay no, no, for yeah, their students shouldn't. to attend. But I think staff do. I mean, I think anybody else has to pay do the going rate. Right. It's $170 yeah. a week. Yeah, okay. All right. yeah that's it's not going rate. Right. Yeah. Mm -mm. So, so if we get this grant, it's $60,000, but we're paying $85,000 on top of that? Yes. So yes. it's $145,000 to run the program for two kids? Right. Fort Morgan High School kids? That's mm -hmm. correct. Okay. I don't think it's taxpayer. I don't think it's fiscally responsible for us to spend taxpayers' mm -hmm. money on daycare for people. But isn't it also a, re a retention issue for our faculty? We don't have that many faculty who are. In, how many faculty do have kids there? I would just say that I've been. I know that we have staff members who have children there. It's a select mem number of staff members. Not all staff members are even aware that it's an option. From the people I've talked to, and um, it's not a. Um, I think someone said maybe it would be attract, attract new staff members and that's never, I guess no one's ever really asked me, I guess at a job fair, not that it couldn't happen, but we don't get new teachers because of that option, I guess. I think if we were to fund it for any staff members, we should fund it for all staff that's members. Right. And I don't think we're in a position to do that. I'm not recommending we do that right that's now, but I don't believe we should pick and choose a few people in this in the school district to get to use that service I think I think one of the challenges too that you know we're, we're just in this process right now we've got an, we have another meeting next week on really trying to look at our budget and trying to make some good decisions uh, you know with with our budget. and I'm not saying we haven't been I'm just trying to say we're trying to really analyze how we spend money out of that out of our budget and are there dollars that we can target in other places for, you know, for advancing initiatives, for, you know, just quite frankly, for salary for our employees? Can we find some additional dollars that way? Um, but, but you know, what? Quite frankly, we just haven't done the analysis on this program and on a number of other programs. And I just, I want to make sure we do it properly and, fit and with equity across all of our programs and we are really able to come back to you folks and say here's this program here's the results we get here's how much it cost costs here's this program you know if uh, if it's a hundred and forty five thousand dollar program to run you know is that how the board wants to, s to spend 
spend money that way. I, I'm still kind of confused, but if, if it's just the two high school students, kids that would be in the program, is it going to cost 140000 I mean, it, does What's it matter how many kids are in there? I actually wish Mike Lee were here because he's done. <laughs> Last year we actually started talking about it um, just briefly, and him and I have had some discussions about, because I actually was just wondering, and so he's done some fiscal analysis and he does all the finances for the program, so it, he'd be the one to really ask, but my understanding is it's 80000 out the door general fund money, but, I mean, it runs on a much bigger budget, but really it's still costing taxpayers $80,000 is, is what the way he explained it to me. Now, I haven't actually looked at detailed expenses, but the rest of the money are grants, and that's how they've sustained their programming with it only being $80,000 and not $145,000 if you don't have the Buell Foundation grant. So if we choose not to let them get the grant, then those high school kids, that what's going to happen to those babies? Nothing? Do you know how old those moms are? What well, are the they, they, next they're, they're pregnancy? And I know we have two more expecting okay. so that would give us four total for next year. So what's going to happen to those four if we're not going to fund this? Right. right. It's not all, it's not required. Some kids, some people, uh, students choose not to send their kids to the daycare. Okay. They have outside, they sure. either a parent, a grandparent, or their own. Yep, and one of the other things that I think has happened, I think the original intent, I mean, this program has existed for a while. We did have, and I think 16 or 17 um, high school students who had kids in the program. It's, it's kind of unfortunate even like, so Vicki's kids right now can't really take advantage because of transportation. And so those are, I mean, she's got kid. she's got, I'm not really sure how many students she has with kids right now, but how many? One. But I, I mean, it's, it's those kids can't take advantage really if they don't all the way across town to get to school at Lincoln. And so um, there was only one parent to start with, so now we have two. In the you know, I would feel most comfortable with the board on on this issue of avoiding before we make any decisions, and this was a discussion item for this evening, I'd feel most comfortable um, as we go through this budget process is getting more precise numbers for the board to lead decision making on so that we all are talking with the same numbers. I, I'm not quite sure where we get the $140,000 number um, and, and I want to make sure, you know, in, in fairness to everyone, I know we're all trying to provide the best information we have in this this evening, but I'd, you know, I'd like Mike to be here where we can all look at the budget, look at how much we spend, and then we can, we can base our decision making on that. And we can look at all, and we can look at several other programs at the same time with, with, with clarity and say, is this, you know, is it is this how we want to spend those dollars because we don't have obviously we don't have unlimited dollars but she needs to apply for this grant immediately i mean this isn't something we can really put off right no i, I meant putting off decision on the program in terms of the grant i guess what i can do um, is contact the grant people tomorrow and make sure as you were saying trish that if you know, if we don't want to follow through with the second year of this program, we can just cancel the grant at that time. I can't imagine we cannot. Well, and I would think that they would just pay it back, whatever we haven't used. Have the ability to just do a one-year grant instead of a two-year. I mean, yeah, yeah it, it's nice when you can have multi-years, but I think that um, there's got to be an option there. Who sets the rates? The, we charge for like the staff that uses the facility, the services. I'm I'm not sure. I don't actually know the answer. Sherry, Sherry, that was going to okay. say I, I believe the Sherry sets them. 
I guess one thing I would ask is that we do some research and find out what, what the market is right now. It's because expensive. It, it's not really fair to the rest of the staff that aren't using that if we're subsidizing. Yeah, I don't have, is, is $170, is that Cheap. Very, very, a very good deal? Yeah, I would say it's. Uh, it's very. I'd say it's comparable. It's competitive. Yes, it's very mm -hmm. competitive with other. The, the, the problem is that the benefit. I guess the benefit is they don't uh, make you pay for the summer spots, and that's what's really enticing some of our staff members is uh, other daycare uh, providers make you pay for the summer spots to hold your spot for the following school year. So you're paying for it when you're at home with your child. So they don't make them pay over the summer. So you're saving money. Because they're not open. Right, because they're not open. They're only open when the kids are in the building. So, for example, today, when we have professional development, they were not open. Um. Okay. Thank you. So, so does that seem like a good route? And then I will contact this grant organization first thing tomorrow and process that. Is it? I, I'm, I think that's the direction the board has given me, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to the consent and agenda. I'll, and I'll get right back with you after that's done. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Hammock. Moving on to consent agenda. Uh, with, before you, we have a personal action report that includes the 2019 to 2020 uh, administrative recommendations, certified class staff renewals and non-renewals, as well as the list of uh, checks for the month of January. What is the pleasure of the board? Move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, uh, roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Lauren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weinert. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Moving on to uh, action items. Uh, action item A, consideration to approve the hiring of Chris DePaulis, PLS King Surveyors to prepare survey of the Legion field. I move we approve. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Lauren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weingarten. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, action item C, consideration to approve the advanced placement ex I missed one, I'm sorry. Action item B, uh, consideration to approve the A, alternative education campus renewal for Lincoln High School. Move to approve. I'll second. Okay, motion is second. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Lauren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weingarten. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, action item C, consideration to approve the advanced placement exam fee grant uh, program. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Lauren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weingarten. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, moving on to advanced planning. Uh, work session next next Monday at 5.30 uh, regarding budget, facilities, and grounds. Our next regular meeting is April 15th. Upcoming meetings May 6th and 20th uh, and work session on May 13th. Uh, Lincoln <coughs> graduation is May 10th, 2019. Graduation for the high school is May 18, 2019, and the last day of school is May 24th, 2019. Uh, moving on to Executive Session A, uh, personal matters, except if an employee who is the subject of the Executive Session requests an open meeting, that the personal matter involves more than one employee. All the employees must request an open meeting discussion of personnel policies that do not require Discussion matters specific to particular employees are not considered personal matters according to CRS 24-6-402 subsection 4 subsection F. And if we could invite Dr. Hammock into the executive session. Do approve. Okay. 
Have a second? I'll second. A motion and a second to go to executive session A. Is there any discussion? Okay, roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Lauren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weingarten. Aye. The motion passes. Um, executive session B, determination of positions, rights, of matters. MAD subject to negotiation, <laughs> development of strategies, strategy for negotiations and instruction of negotiation, uh, negotiators except the discussion of negotiations regarding relating to collective bargaining or employment contracts shall occur in a public meeting unless an executive session is otherwise allowed. <coughs> According to CRS 24-6-402 subsection 4 subsection E. And if we could invite Dr. Hammock, Michael Boyer, and Unfortunately, Mike Lee is not here, so it's the pleasure of the board. I move to approve. Second. Okay, we'll motion a second. Any discussion? Roll call. Derek Gerken. Aye. Terry Lapp. Aye. Trish McLean. Aye. Todd Schneider. Aye. Warren Sharp. Aye. Melissa Smith. Aye. Connie Weingarten. Aye. Motion passes. And um, we'll adjourn regular meeting, the regular school board meeting and re-adjourn in executive session. <laughs>